I'm really excited about this one because it's something that uh, I think we don't always think about, which is the legal aspect of the business. And it can be quite intimidating because of all the legalese and the red tape, and we don't know when we need a lawyer or why we need a lawyer. And today we've got the perspective from both a great lawyer and a great blogger who have had experience on both sides of that equation. And so what we're going to do first is hear from our attorney, who is Jamie Lieberman, and then we're going to hear from our blogging perspective, which is Julie Blanner. So I'm going to introduce both of them now. First, Jamie is a partner and founder of Hashtag Legal, which is a law firm specializing in working with influencer marketing professionals and businesses with a digital presence. Jamie has experience uh, advising on trademarks, copyrights, drafting and reviewing contracts, site terms, FTC disclosures, all the things that everyone needs when they are conducting business on, in the digital space. She's been a practicing lawyer for over 10 years, and she's worked for an international law firm in New York City and is the former director of operations and chief counsel for an influencer network. And then we have Julie, who is sitting over there. Julie is a lifestyle blogger and entertaining expert who began sharing her effortless style through her blog in 2009. She honed her signature style with a captivating collection of recipes, home design, travel tips, DIY, and entertaining advice. She's got an ever-growing personal brand and countless partnerships with advertisers. She's worked with 7th Generation Fairlife, Martha Stewart, Keurig, La Crema, Lowe's, and more. She's been fe featured in print with People Magazine, Better Homes and Gardens, Good Housekeeping, Women's Day, and many more. So we're gonna start with Jamie, then we'll move to Julie. Thank you, guys. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Guys. I was on the bus with you. I know what you guys sound like, how loud everyone here can be. Well, good morning. I am very excited to be here with you guys. And I am very excited to talk about legal because legal is fun, said no one ever. But we are going to make it fun because legal does not have to be scary. And so we are going to talk about trademarks, we're going to talk about copyrights, and we're going to talk about LLC formation and entity formation. And then my lovely co-presenter, Julie, is going to talk all about contracts. And she's going to talk about it from her perspective as someone who enters into contracts all the time. If there are legal questions about contracts, I can absolutely answer them, but I'm going to leave most of that to Julie, because I know you're in amazing hands. I am going to say, I have a lot of information to cover. So if you guys could hold questions to the end, I would greatly appreciate it. So thank you. So entity formation. This is a question I get all the time. When do I form an entity? What is an entity? An entity is some kind of corporate form. What is a corporate form? I'm going to try to use as little legalese as possible, but when I use it, I'm going to explain it because I hate legalese. I don't practice that way, but sometimes I have to use it. So an entity is any kind of form that you're doing business under. It can be an LLC. It can be a C Corp. It can be a sole proprietorship, a partnership, an S Corp. And I'm going to explain what each one of those is. But when do you form one? when you start making a dollar. And all of you are with Mediavine, so I know you are making far more than a dollar. When you start making money, you have a business. And when you have a business, you have assets. And when you have assets, you need to protect them. And I'm not saying this to scare anybody. If you're sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, I make so much money and I do not have an entity formed, do not panic. You can form it at any time. It is fine, and you, there's a lot of things that go into the consideration of what you're going to form, how you're going to form it, and when you're going to form it. The first thing I'll say is you want to talk to your tax professional. I don't go anywhere near taxes, so I cannot give any tax advice, but I can give you some good legal information, and you should balance the two. But if you are starting to make money on your business, if you have assets in your business, which includes your intellectual property, your name, your your website, your mailing list, those all have value and can be sold at some point. Or somebody could, if there's an issue, come and those are the assets in your business if you were to get sued. You want to protect them and you want to make sure that they're kept separate from your personal assets. So what are the different entities that you can possibly form? An LLC, that's the most common one. It's a limited liability company that is a state formed entity. The federal government doesn't care about your LLC. 
essentially, if you form an LLC, it's the easiest entity to form. Um, it usually consists of, and it goes state by state, but you're usually filing a document with your Secretary of State, Department of Taxation, depends on the state, and then you enter into an operating agreement, which is just a document that governs your LLC, so you know what happens in the case you want to sell it, or if you want to add a partner, or if you have a partner, something like that. Um, and then you have to keep up what are called corporate formalities, legalese. What does that mean? So if you form an LLC, you need to make sure that all your business stuff is separate from all your personal stuff. So that means you're signing contracts in your LLC name. You have a business bank account. You have a business credit card. You are keeping all of your income separate. You do not go to Nordstrom and buy a pair of shoes with your business credit card, no matter how cute they are. It's tempting, I know, but you have to keep it separate. And so you have to keep your books separate. Because if you don't, then if you were to get sued, a court could do something called piercing the corporate veil. Lawyers love words that don't mean anything. And all that means is the court sets aside your LLC. And what your LLC does is it keeps your business assets separate from your personal assets. So if you were to get sued, say you got one of those copyright letters that everyone is afraid of and we'll talk about a little later, the court can only, a, a potential person with a judge, to get a judgment against you, can only leverage on your business assets. Your house is safe, your car is safe, your bank accounts are safe. So long as your business assets are separate in that LLC. Some people love the term S-Corp, although with our new tax laws, <laughs> a lot of people are questioning whether or not those make sense. But an S-Corp is not really an entity that you form. It is essentially a tax status. So if you have an LLC, you can take S-Corp status, and your accountant can help you with that. And so that's an accounting decision. It's not really a decision that, I would, that a lawyer typically recommends unless they're a tax attorney. Um, so an S-Corp is another entity that people frequently ask me about. So LLCs and S-Corps are the two most common entities that I see formed for people in the influencer marketing space, particularly influencers. A C-Corp is a corp. It's an ink. It's what everybody typically sees with large companies. They're very complicated. They require shares and boards of directors, and it doesn't typically make sense for your average blogger. And since I don't have um, a ton of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But if anybody has questions, I can answer them. If you're doing business as you, if you're just sort of hanging out and you're you, you're a sole proprietor. And so a lot of you who may not have formed an entity, that's what you are. There is no legal status to being a sole proprietor. It's just your income, and your ta it's a tax thing. So you don't have to do anything. If you filed a DBA, which some of you is called a doing business as, say your, your website is different than your name, and you want the world to know that you own your website, but you don't want to form anything, that's typically through a sole proprietorship. And this is the same with a partnership. If you have a buddy, and you guys are doing something together, creating a course together, but you don't enter into any official paperwork, you just sort of do it together, you're a partnership. There's no legal protections with a partnership at all. I would recommend highly that if you are entering into a partnership, you have a really good partnership agreement. Don't just enter into a fun friend, if you're friends with somebody and you want to put something together, I unfortunately see those go wrong all the time. So no what the terms of your partnership is, even if you don't want to form an LLC, at least have a partnership agreement. So what do I need to do? Um, some people do it themselves. I have a lot of clients that come to me and talk to me and say, ultimately, I want to do my LLC myself. And that's fine. You can. You can go on your Secretary of State's website. You can file it. Different states have different things. New York State is particularly complicated, so my clients there typically don't want to do it themselves. California can be a little bit tricky as well. The operating agreement is usually the part where I have a client come to me if they want to do it themselves, and I may do that for them. Um, that's an important document to have. You're not required by law in almost all states to have an operating agreement, but it's just really good. And one of the reasons and benefits of doing that is because it just gives legitimacy to your entity. And so if you do run into an issue, and somebody is, sues you or you have some kind of problem and they're looking into the formality of your LLC, they're going to look at that. They'll want to know that your bank accounts are separate, that you have an operating agreement, and that you're really doing business as this LLC. 
trademarks. So this is the one I get all the questions on. I think every Facebook group in the Facebook group, these were all the questions. So let's talk about trademarks. What's a trademark? A lot of people don't really have a good grasp of what a trademark even is. And so the thing I like everybody to understand about a trademark is you have to look at the trademark through the lens of a consumer. They, the trademark, the US Patent and Trademark Office, or the USPTO, they don't care about the trademark owner. They care about consumers. So everything about trademarks is about consumer confusion. You as a consumer need to know that when you're going to google.com, you are getting the service from google.com that you expect to get. And so nobody else can use that name because otherwise it would be confusing. You would think you're getting the incredible quality of service from Google, but if someone was using their name or a name that was confusing to that name and the service wasn't as good, that would be confusing. You wouldn't know what was going on. So it's a name, it's a word, it's a symbol. It can be a smell, that's my favorite. A color, you know, the Pink Panther insulation, that pink is trademarked. The shape of the Coca-Cola bottle, which is trademarked. So anything can be trademarked. Um, it doesn't just have to be a name. Logos and names are the most common things I see in my practice. The other really important thing to remember is trademarks are acquired by use. You don't just get to take all the trademarks and hoard them. You have to use them. And so in order to be able to have trademark protection, you get it through use. And so if you're first to use, awesome. You have some trademark protections, even if you don't register it. You get more with registration. So how, what can you trademark, right? This is something, there are two things that the trademark office looks at when they think about the viability of a trademark. This is something called the spectrum of distinctiveness, which to me just seems, I don't know, it doesn't mean anything. But what it means is this. The trademark office loves what they call fanciful marks. Words that mean nothing and suddenly acquire a meaning because someone's used it. Xerox, Kleenex, Google. Those words were made, Exxon, those words were made up words that suddenly became something because they became a brand. That is the strongest trademark you can have, is a made up word. On this spectrum, and you really can think of it almost like a number line, on the next level is something called an arbitrary, Apple computers. Apple's a word, we all know what apples are, but you would never think it's a computer. So it is completely arbitrary. It in no way describes what it is the product is. And so that's very, very trademarkable. You then get into the gray parts. Suggestive is the last sort of line on my spectrum of distinctiveness that's trademarkable. Suggestive trademarks are trademarks that sort of suggest a quality but don't describe it. For example, Sprint, right? You think fast. So you think their data is fast, but they're not saying we have fast data. They're just saying sprint. And so it suggests something, but doesn't describe it. And then you get into descriptiveness and generic. Descriptiveness is the hardest thing that people struggle with because we want to name what our product and service is, right? So when you start using a name that describes what it is that you're doing, for example, park and fly. That describes what it is. You park and then you fly. That's descriptive. It's not trademarkable. Because the trademark office is going to say, anybody could, it, it doesn't tell you who owns that product. It's not, consumers aren't going to have an understanding because it's just not distinctive. Um, and so I see a lot of trademark rejections on descriptiveness. And so when you're going to trademark, that's something that you have to think about, and most people don't know it. Because the thing that people think most about is likelihood of confusion. Is there another trademark out there that is just like my trademark? That one's really important. Do your research before you start a business, but you'll need to know if there's another mark out there that's registered or that's the same or similar. It can't, you can't add an S and make it distinctive or make it not confusing. It has to be far enough. So where do I start? You have to research, and I don't just mean a Google search. You have to go into, and I'll drop these links in the Facebook group. I didn't want to put up a whole bunch of links. The trademark office has a whole database. It's called TESS, T-E-S-S, -S, and if you Google it, you'll find it. You can do a basic mark search just to see if your name's marked. Um, and so that's important. 
You also want to research Google, Facebook groups. When I do a trademark research, it is extensive. It takes a long time. I look at company names on state levels, on federal. I look all over. It's not just a Google search. But for your purposes, if you're just looking to make sure that your name is OK and you're not infringing on someone's trademark and you don't want to get the dreaded cease and desist, Google, Facebook, and Tess are a great place to start. Before you launch, it's never a bad thing, particularly if you're investing a lot of money into a product, to talk to an attorney and have them do that research for you. When you start using, and if you've been using, you do get trademark protection under the common law. The common law means law we all made up. And so it's either law, common law or statute law. And so under the common law, you get some protections um, other people can't just start using your name. If you were using it first, even if they try to register it, you can stop them. Um, and so there's things that you can do as long as you're using the name. And the other important piece is you have to use the name in commerce. That means you make money off the name. You can't just use it for a hobby. And it has to be interstate commerce, which means it has to be state to state. So I, if I want to trademark a name and I have a, an ad on my website, that's enough. You guys are all making money in interstate commerce because you have ads on your websites. That's fine. You could sell a t-shirt to your friend in Pennsylvania and you've made money in interstate commerce if you live in New Jersey or New York or anywhere. So that's also important. And then federal registration. Um, which is another way for you to get protections. And the federal registration, it's a long process that we'll talk about, but it gives you the most protection for your trademark. So the reason to register, if you want to use your brand nationwide, and most people online use their brand nationwide. There are definitely some hyperlocal brands. It doesn't matter as much. But if you're using your brand nationwide, that's definitely something to think about. To avoid confusion, how many blog names out there do you know that are so similar? And you get crossed emails, and sometimes somebody's trying to email you, but they're emailing the person whose blog name is very similar to yours. Timing is another thing. Is you get priority from first use, but if someone starts using it, you don't stop them, and then they register it, they may be able to continue with that registration, and then you're limited in what you can do with your brand name if their registration is successful. So that's important. And the last thing is credibility. It's the same thing with LLCs. When a company comes in and they want to work with you, they want to see certain things. They want to know that you have an entity set up. They want to know you're taking your business seriously, and a trademark is another thing that does that. It gives you credibility um, with either someone who is doing business with you, entering into agreements with you, or somebody who may want to buy your blog one day. Because if you don't have your intellectual property, your blog is worth way less without that registered trademark. A great thing about the registration and why you should register is because it, it is a deterrent to others. It's a notice. But it also, more legalese, is a legal presumption of validity. What does that mean? That means that a court assumes you have a valid trademark. The process is long. It is nine months to a year to get a trademark, and you have to go through a lot of hoops. So once you get that certificate, which is so cool with the gold seal, and it's so proud, you have that legal presumption. So the court says, uh-uh, you don't have to prove anything if someone sues you for trademark infringement. That other person has to prove you don't have a valid trademark, and that is hard. So it's a huge deterrent to other people even trying to use your name. You cannot sue in federal court for trademark infringement unless you have a registered trademark. A lot of people don't know that. And so you're really limited in what you can do. You can send a lot of angry cease and desists. You can sue for other things, but you can't sue for trademark infringement. And the beauty of trademark of the registration is the statute gives you all these enhanced penalties, meaning you get lawyer's fees, you get d triple damages in certain instances. So you get, if you, if you sue someone for trademark infringement and you win, they pay you quite a bit. So what's the process? The process is long. It's just a warning from the beginning. You gotta be in it for the long haul. Um, and I do recommend that at minimum you consult with an attorney because I fix a lot of trademark registrations gone wrong. Um, and here's why. The research is everything. I spend a really long time on the research to make sure that your name is as trademarkable as sure as I can be. 
Um, and I look for the distinctiveness challenges and I look for the likelihood of confusion. I do all that research. I then come back and I give you an opinion. A lot of times names change. I just had a whole thing with a client who wanted to start a whole brand new business and I went back to her and I said, you're not gonna get this trademark. Here's why. We tweaked the name a little bit. We were set and ready to go. Then the filing. In the filing, the filing is a little bit strange. It's not that bad. You have to have certain information, but the, the crazy thing about the filing is the class. So a lot of people don't know this, but when you register a trademark, you register it in a class. So you don't get rights to that name across every class of every good of every service. And an example of that is Dove Soap and Dove Chocolate. Two different companies, two different trademarks. And so they're trademarked in a certain class. So we have a class for blogs, which is awesome, and we have a class for courses, and we have a class for coaching. And so you need to pick your class, and it is really hard to write those classes. And a lot of times you get rejected on the class description. And so the class is important. And then there's two types of filing. You can do what's called an intent to use application, meaning I haven't started using it yet in commerce, but I'm going to in the next six to nine months. That's how you hold a name when you're launching a product. This is how when people come to me and say, I really wanna launch this product and I wanna to go to investors or I wanna talk to potential clients, what do I do? I'm like, you're gonna trademark your name. That's the first thing you're gonna do. And there's a lot of other things you can do to protect yourself, but that's a big one. So an intent to use or an actual use in commerce. And so I'm describing that. If you file an actual use in commerce, you have to use what's called specimens which are pictures or of how you're using it in commerce. Screenshots of your blog, a screenshot of an ad. If you sell a course, a screenshot of the shopping cart. So you have to have all these screenshots and then you have to describe them. So then it is sent off and then we wait for months and months. And in about three months, the trademark office will assign you a trademark examiner. And that trademark examiner will literally do all of the work that I just did as an attorney and will write an assessment about whether or not you can trademark your name. And then you get the office actions, which is typically when I get the panicked phone calls because they look scary and they are long and there's hundreds of attachments and people are like, what did I do? And that is the trademark office coming back and saying there's something deficient about this. Sometimes they're super easy fixes. It's like click of a button or as an attorney, I get on a call and I call the trademark office and I say, you're drunk, let's fix this. And they fix it, but only I can do that. Um, and other times they're much more complicated. If you get a likelihood of confusion uh, office action, that's harder. That becomes a full back and forth. Um, and then once you're passed through that part, you then go to what's called publication and then you wait more. And then eventually, in about a month or two, the trademark office actually puts your trademark in a little gazette, and the public for 30 days can oppose your trademark. Anybody can oppose. It's delightful. <laughs> and so you get some very interesting oppositions. Hopefully we get none. If we've done our research, we're not gonna get any. There's the occasional crazy, but we deal with that. Those are full-blown litigations. They are full-blown. We are back and forth with court documents. There's all kinds of, ugh. We negotiate those away, and that's the other beauty of you don't have to worry about any of that. I don't get many of those knock wood. I'm probably going to get one tomorrow because I just said that. But nine times out of ten, if we've done our research, we're not going to get one of those. And then once we pass through publication, you get your certificate probably two months later. But you're good. Your priority date is from the day you filed, so it doesn't matter. We can wait all day. And then you get to switch from a TM to a little R, and it's very exciting. So that's the process. Copyright. I only have a few more minutes. I'm going to run through this quickly because I get a lot of these questions. What is a copyright? A copyright is anything original. That just means you did it. it there is no standard for originality. You do not have to paint the next Mona Lisa to get a copyright. It can be anything you've done as long as you didn't copy it. In fact, I could take a picture of you guys. Julie can come stand next to me and take a picture of you guys and we would both have a copyright even though it's the same image because I took it and she took it. Fixed in a tangible medium. That just means you put it somewhere on paper or online. Doesn't mean anything other than it's not in your brain. You gotta get it out. And you get a copyright from the moment you create it. Copyright is way easier to deal with than trademarks. You can register copyrights yourself. Um, I, don't, I typically tell clients, unless they don't wanna spend the time, which I understand, go do it yourself. That's a great way to save some money is to just register your copyrights yourself. 
One thing to remember is you can only copyright the work, not ideas. So a lot of times when people have this brilliant idea for a course and they come to me and they say, I want to have a partner, like how do I protect it? You can't protect your ideas in through copyright. There's other ways, but you only copyright what you've actually written down, not all the brilliant ideas in your head. A really great way that I'm seeing a lot of people making money with their copyright is through licensing. And this is a huge way that I'm seeing a lot of, of influencers really making some pa good passive income. Something that you've created, right? And you want to let other people use it. How do you do that? With, with copyright, you get this bundle of rights, right? And if you think of them like sticks, this is really how they taught it in law school and it always makes me laugh. You get the right to reproduce, distribute, display, perform, create a derivative work. What that means is you're creating something out of something new out of something you made. The Harry Potter books became the Harry Potter movies. Those are derivative works. You can transfer it. You can do all of those things. You can transfer all your rights. You can transfer none of your rights. Think about your contracts. And Julia will talk a little more about this, and I am running out of time, so I will certainly touch on this more in questions. But make sure when you are transferring any of those rights, whether it's all of them, some of them, or none of them, you have it in writing. And this could be something as, as simple as a blog post to a photograph, to something as complicated is to the framework of an app. All of those things need to be transferred in writing with your license, because then you know what the terms of your license are. You know what the person can do, how long they can do it for. I'm going to have to skip this, but I will happily answer questions. And that too, which I know loads of people have questions about. So keep them, and I'll answer them. Um, and yeah, so thank you guys. Um, this is my information. Um, I have a podcast where we talk about all this stuff. And we also have a Facebook group called The Businesses HQ, where you can join, and we answer loads of questions in there, my partner Danielle and I. Um, so yeah, thank you. All right, make sure I'm ready to go here. I'm Julie Blanner, and I have started my blog. I started it in January of 2008. And as a 10-year veteran blogger, I've seen partnerships evolve and change over time. I know some of you might recall that um, when partnerships began, it was as easy as them sending you product, payment up front sometimes, and just asking for a simple mention and maybe even a link. Um, and now, as you know, things have evolved quite a bit, and their ask, the asks are getting more entailed and complex, and we need a little more protection. A contract is designed to protect both parties. I think it was really easy earlier on in my career, and even maybe about four or five years ago, I started feeling like the little guy. And I felt like the contracts were really you know, designed to protect them, and like, what was I going to do? What were you know, what was my recourse? And um, I realized it was time to start tweaking these contracts to protect me and my business because nobody else was looking out for it. And one thing that you can do is read your contract carefully. Absolutely anyone can do that. I had um, a friend contact me via Facebook a few weeks ago and asked, what do you do when somebody is past due on their payment? They're not responding, you know, I've sent several notices, I've even tried to call them. And I said, well, what did your contract say? And they responded back, well, I don't know, let me look at that real quick. So went back and sent me the contract because they weren't sure what it really meant. There wasn't an actual payment date. You actually had to read through it, you know, 10 pages of um, legal mumbo jumbo that is best handled by somebody like Jamie. But um, if you just really break it down and read it bit by bit, it said that payment would be within 60 days at the end of the term. So then I went and looked at when the term was. While this post was done in early December, the end of the, payment ter the, end of the term wasn't until June 30th. So it's 60 days from then. Well, they were really unimpressed with that, but I said, really, you have no recourse. That is something that you signed unknowingly, like you have to read your contracts. If you don't understand it, ask questions. I understand that 
a lot of times um, it is a little confusing and you can even ask them to change the language to something a little more relatable. But whatever you do, make sure you update your contracts to protect you. Um, when I first started doing my own contracts, I would use markup and you can do that like on Safari, you just open it and you can even in, well, it's easy, really easy in Word, but if you do it in like a PDF, you can do it through Adobe. There are so many different ways to do it, but in preview, even on your phones, you can circle it with your finger, you can do a strike through, but anything that doesn't suit you, you can um, adapt and change and send it over to the brand or agency. And what you might find in a lot of contracts now is you have spent weeks trying to get together on an agreement, coming to terms, of what you'll do for how much. And then you read your contract and you're like, oh, I didn't agree to work for hire. Oh, I didn't know they wanted you know, five images. And it can feel a little disheartening. But really, those again are just asks. And my friend Cheryl Susan over here, Tidy Mom, she a couple years ago said, you know, that's just the second phase of negotiation. You have to stand up for yourself. And so don't be intimidated as they have possibly a whole team of people advocating for them and you need to advocate for you, whether that's through your lawyer or you're doing it on your own, you really need to advocate for yourself and what works for your business and your brand. So don't be afraid to renegotiate those terms. Um, <coughs> Also, I know it can feel really intimidating when working through a platform or wanting to sign onto a platform about their terms. I know Collectively had added in that you send in high resolution images with each campaign. Um, TAP says that they can use your images any which way they want, so does Ahology. But you don't have to agree to those terms, and that doesn't mean you can't work through the platform. Oftentimes, the brands are working through the platform is just a way of gathering stats. Each one works a little different, but let's take TAP for example. They're working through the platform to gather stats and information, uh, maybe finding the best fit of blogger, but they're not always opposed to working outside of the platform. So I have my lawyer draw up a contract outside of it with different terms um, of what we come to agreement with and stating that TAP has no rights. So, um, and collectively, I have had a really great relationship for, with them for years, but their terms of service say that you give them high resolution images. And um, there are sometimes brands just really wanna work with you. You create your brand to put yourself in a position where brands want to work with you, and in any platform or agency is going to make it work. And so um, I don't license my images through them either. So figure out what are your terms. Um, one of the questions in the Mediavine group, which I absolutely love, is what should be in every contract? And some of this is really basic, but the parties. You wanna know though, are you working directly with the brand? Is it the brand that's going to pay you? Or is it the agency? Sometimes I might work through an agency, but then it's the brand that will send the 1099 and the paycheck. So no, who are the parties that are um, in this contract? And as that Facebook mentioned, that, or the Facebook question I mentioned earlier, know your term. You know, I try to keep my terms really short, so that way um, I can kind of move on from it. You know, I wanna do my work, I wanna do it well, but I don't want it to limit any other future opportunities. So um, determine your term. Of course, your fee of what you've negotiated, either during initial discussions or during the contract, but that should absolutely be in your contract. And again, payment terms and late fees. And don't feel like you have to accept their payment terms. One of the easiest things I negotiate is my own payment terms. I require through most um, agencies 50% up front and 50% within 30 days. Well, a lot of them, their standard terms are 60 or 90 days after the day that the post goes live, not the day the post is turned into them for review or the work is done. Sometimes there's months of lag time there. Um, and so the more you do up front, the less stress it is in the end. Also, scope of work. I know this, again, feels like another basic, but a lot of times contracts, they have 
will send the scope of work separate or in a separate document. I always require that to be included in my contract. So that's another thing that we are collectively signing together and agreeing upon. But the scope of work might be, you know, how many social media shares you're going to do. If they're going to use your images for social media shares, do you require an at tag? Um, is a camera sufficient? It's not for me. Um, I want more than photo credit. I created it. So make sure you outline all of that in your scope of work. And one of my favorite things to negotiate is exclusivity. And I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with exclusivity, but I think keeping that term as short as possible is not only great for you, but for the brand. Um, you don't want to tie yourself up and limit your opportunities. And an example of this is I had a chocolate brand last year that had asked for 90 days exclusivity, and we were signing the contract on December 1st. Well, what comes after? Valentine's, Valentine's Day for chocolate. And I knew that that would limit my opportunity. And so we went back and forth and we negotiated. And at first we thought maybe we would shorten the term to just 15 days and stick with my rate. They ended up paying me three times my sponsored post rate for that exclusivity to have me through the end of February. And so sometimes it's important to them, sometimes it's not. If it's important to them, they'll pay for it. If it's not, that gives you the opportunity to work with another brand and um, create more revenue. So another thing I'm a really big stickler on is reviews because I find them to be really exhausting. I can appreciate them to an extent because of course I want you know, a brand or agency to be very proud of my work and you know, for it to fit them as well. But I also don't want it to um, impact my work, limit my voice, or change my style. And I also don't want it to create hiccups of like that never ending review period. So not only if you agree to a review, which I do charge more for because they are a little extra work, um, determine what review period you want. Uh, I think the shorter the better again. It, it, the longer it goes, the more people on their teams that look at it and the more changes they want and the more they keep circling around and it kind of gets messy. So determine that review period. I think 24 to 48 hours is my favorite. I gave a brand um, three weeks this summer and because they just really pushed for it. And it, not only was it too long, but then they weren't ready for it at that time. And um, I said, OK, well, I had protected myself. There was a fee for that. So um, limit how many times you allow them to review it. I know a lot of times I ask some home bloggers, what are some of your concerns? And they're like, well, sometimes a brand wants to review it like five or six times. Well, to me, that's just completely unacceptable because it drags it out and it loses something that's really important to my audience. So um, and the most important thing for me is to create content that really resonates with my audience. Um, and then, of course, fees if they want to change something after the post goes live. I might be a touch more gracious with this um, if a brand doesn't have a review period, but if they do, um, I try to be a stickler. Like, you had the opportunity to review this. Any changes from this point on, that's additional work. There's an additional fee for that. So I include that in my contract as well. I also have, again, this is thanks to Cheryl, so I can't take all the credit here, but I also have a rescheduled fee because, again, sometimes brands, they have delays and they slow things down. Oh, now we can't post it until next Thursday. Well, I have an you know, editorial content to stick by as well, and I have my own interests to, um, to protect. So for me, a reschedule a lot of times creates additional work. Not to mention, I might have planned to be out of town that next Thursday and won't have time to like sit there and comment back you know, quickly on the social and really support it. So it's in the best interest of both if you have a reschedule fee um, to really keep you guys on track on your contracts and reduce stress. Um, I also, as a home blogger, uh, try to keep a product delivery guarantee now. I'm working it into all future contracts because in December, I had not one, but two brands in the busiest month of the year say that they were going to ship product in November. 
I got the product for both of them the week before Christmas. Both required construction. Now, of course, I had my rescheduled fees that were in place, but it was still a disaster. It was a stress. It was a mess. The week before Christmas to have your living room under construction is not my idea of fun. So um, now I have a, a little clause that if the scheduled date is X, I must receive the product by this date. Otherwise, not only um, you know, will you have a rush fee, because I normally would charge a rush fee for something a week before Christmas with a short turnaround, but you'll have a reschedule as well. So I think it's really important to iron these things out up front so that you have less stress in the end. And um, a reshoot fee, I know a lot of you guys have been using this for several years, but when you have to reshoot, it's almost like creating another, an entire new sponsored post. There's a lot of effort going into recreating it, whether it be a food or a restyling or, um, and photographing and editing and everything, and especially with video, I think it's really important. So I have a reshoot fee in all of my contracts, but I still had a brand come to me last year and they said, um, the brand had, or the agency had laid out quite an extensive list of do's and don'ts. And I had it right there, and I mean, I checked that 10 times. And I was like, I got it, this is awesome, I nailed it. I sent it to the agency. They were like, you nailed it, absolutely love it, can't wait to send it to the brand. The brand came back and said, oops, this wasn't supposed to be used in this way the agency dropped the ball. And of course, that puts them in a bad position, but also I want to look great for the brand as well. And it's a brand I love, so I'm like, what do you do? Well, I could reshoot it, with, which with video can be very expensive and time consuming, or I can put a little spin on it and edit a few things out. So I had the reshoot fee in there, but I really didn't want to do it. And so I said, what if we just do this and we edited out a little bit of footage. We both agreed on it, and they still gave me um, about 80% of my reshoot fee. And um, they were happy, I was happy, all worked out. But you know, you can also put a creative, creative spin on that to make that work for you too. But that's extra time, and you need to protect yourself and make sure that you um, are you know, protecting your time, because time is money. Um, one of my favorite ones is image content license or rights. Because lately, it seems like everybody wants free images, and they are never mentioned up front. And so I um, now charge for social media use. You know, if they had to have a, they're using my images on their social to um, promote their product, that's an ad. I should be getting paid for that. That should not be part of a sponsored post rate. I know everybody has differing opinions on that, but figure out where you lie and what works for you. But if they're using it on their website, that's, an, you know, that's a license fee. If they want to use it on print. And it's really hard to determine the amount to charge for your images. I you know, kind of come up with a number that I'm comfortable with based on what I've been paid before, based on styling work I used to do years ago with a photographer and what she charged for commercial images and other photographers I know that charge for commercial images. But another really great tool is going to Getty Images and using their um, calculator and, I, and figuring out how it's being used, how many times it will be used, et cetera, and um, just make sure you get it all in your contract. And maybe double that rate, too. Um, <laughs> and so this is kind of a new one. It's never been my favorite thing, I'm going to be honest. But I really don't like to turn off ads when I'm doing a sponsored post because New posts, that's when you, you, know, you get a lot of early on impressions, and it's like guaranteed ad, ad revenue. Well, it's brought to my attention recently that Google considers the sponsored post to be advertorial, and so placing ads on those is like a conflict of interest. So I'm thinking we might be seeing some changes with this in the future, but it's something to start thinking about um, integrating into your contracts. And I know some brands don't even ask for it, but maybe they would like it. Maybe you can offer them to set the campaign for 30, 60, or 90 days. It's a really quick little check box with Mediavine. But um, say, hey, 
and I can turn off the ads for 30 days for this much extra, you know, or something along those lines. But it's something to definitely start considering. Um, another thing that has been brought to my attention is that you want to make sure that agencies do not per purchase traffic to direct to your post. This is another um, thing that's becoming very common in the last couple of years and can affect your site and site quality. Um, of course, those things, like, they can purchase through Facebook or Twitter. You know, they can boost your post. That's still okay, whitelisting. But um, no traffic or bots from, you know, foreign countries, all inflated, not real. Uh, so that's something else that you might want to consider integrating into your contracts moving forward because that can, you know, overall affect your business. And again, you have to make things work for your terms. For me, my terms, I don't allow branded messaging. I know they love their branded messaging points. I know they spent six months coming up with them, and they're so proud of them, but they sound like just that, an ad. And I never want my site to sound like an ad. And that might be because, um, like I said, mentioned earlier, 10 years ago, they just kind of wanted to mention maybe a link, and I got to do whatever I wanted. But I think that really resonates with my audience. So I never want my post to feel like an ad. So I um, am very upfront that I do not offer branded messaging to be integrated into my content. I also do not use a brand mention in a title. And again, that's something, if you do, absolutely fine. But I just thought I'd share a few of my terms that I work into my, con uh, my contracts. And again, not to sound like an ad, but I want it to be in my own authentic voice. And I will not use excessive hashtags. Two is my limit. And I really try to pare it down to one whenever possible. So you have to develop what your terms are. It's kind of a good thing to just sit down and write out you know, what you're thinking about and whether that's something you incorporate into your contracts or you turn over uh, to a lawyer like Jamie. I think it's really important to protect you and your business. And I had a few other questions from the Mediavine um, Facebook group. And one was, what do you do if they ask you to pull the post because of a product concern, lack of availability in your area, or something like that? I had this happen several years ago. And I was like, oh, yikes. I don't know what to do with this. And it was like a couple days after it went live. Turns out, a big company that I, can't men I shouldn't mention, but um, just didn't dot their I's and cross their T's and didn't have the right to use something that they thought they did. And so they wanted me to pull the content down. Well, I think that's another great thing to incorporate into your contract. What do you do in this situation? Um, for me, that situation, I just removed all branded, um, you know, any brand mentions, any links to them, things like that, any photos with their picture, and that was acceptable to them. But I never really want to remove a post permanently from my site. So that might be something you want to include as well. And then um, somebody else asked, what are there are extras in the contract that you didn't previously discuss? I mentioned that before, but renegotiate. Never, ever be afraid to renegotiate. There are a lot of times where I come into negotiating a contract at one cost, and then I receive the contract sometimes weeks later and you know, can triple the rate. So renegotiate it. If it's important to them, they'll pay for it. If not, those asks, you, know, you can eliminate them. And nine times out of 10, they're more than happy to eliminate them or pay more for them. You just have to ask. And another question was, is when should you push back on changes made by PR, like especially in a, in a period of review? You have to remind them, this is your site. You know your audience. You know what resonates and works for them and works for you. You know your own authentic voice. So anytime that something doesn't feel comfortable to you, I absolutely think you should push back. And I know it's so hard. But you know, I kind of try to like kill them with kindness before and after. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to work with you, da 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 da. But, um, you know, this is, uh, I can offer this for that much, you know, kind of push back a little bit. So anything that doesn't feel right, just talk to them about. And most times agencies, they just want to make, you know, they're the middleman. They just want to kind of make things work on both parties. So they're eager to please as well. So, OK. 
come down back up for questions. Thank you. Well, if you guys have questions, do you mind using the, one of the mics? Thanks. So I had a situation last year where I had a contract with a company and I, they had sent me the product and days before I was about to work on the post, they sent me an email and they're like, we ran out of money, we can't pay you. <laughs> um, what should I have done? <laughs> I'm really annoyed. What did, did, your con did you have a contract? Yeah. What did, did it say what, how, how they, whether or not they can terminate with or without cause? That's um, where you would look for that. I should have looked for it there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, mean, I figured I couldn't demand them to pay me because. Well, you they can't didn't get blood from money. stone. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I thought. But that being said, um, you can look to see whether or not they had the right to terminate or how they terminate. Uh -huh. And depending on the value, whether they said they have money or not doesn't mean they don't always have money. So you could have other recourse depending on how what the value of the contract was. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, Can, do you mind oh, going to the microphone? Um, so um, if, if your recipe and photos are republished in a foreign media, let's say a newspaper, <laughs> is there anything we can do over here or just because it's their policy and their countries like that? So that is copyright infringement. Um, it, de it depends. So I've had clients who've had this issue where scraping sites or you know, somebody's image gets stolen. Um, if it's online, you absolutely can go to the host provider and you can fill out the DMCA, the Digital Millennial Copyright Act, no take down matter, like where, like I had one of my recipes being published in a, in a magazine that it's actually in a newspaper in England, oh. but it's like, both on their website and on paper. You um, would go to the, you would email them and okay. tell them they're infringing your copyright, presuming you had a copyright, right? Um, yeah. That you have a U.S. copyright, and email them and, and ask them. It to was like a very known risk. Like everybody knew it was mine. Like okay. people were messaging. I was like, hey, have you seen? You've been published there. <laughs> I was like, what? So my recommendation would be to email them and just say, hey, you're, you're infringing my copyright, and I'd like a cease and desist. I'd like you to take it down. Right. Um, their host provider will pull it down. Is there a timeline to do that, or I can like? Because some months have passed, like a couple of months have passed. So. I'd have to look, okay. I'll be honest with you. It's so fact specific. So right. I'd have to really look at that specific Thank you. incident. Well, You're and, welcome. And in the States, I recently um, had a brand use my photograph in a video that was the lead image. Mm. And not only did I do the cease and desist and ask them to take it down, but ended up collecting on it as well for all the use that it incurred between the time that it um, went live until. It got five million views. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so many years ago, I was on Etsy, and my brand name is Made by a Princess. And about three months after I started on Etsy, um, some uh, law office in New York was registered madebyprincess.com. And they've been sitting on that website. There's no other business by that name. I called the attorney's office after so many years. Like, that's just ticking me off, because they're, that's getting traffic. The value of that domain is increasing because people are looking for my site. So I spoke to one of the attorneys and I said, you're squatting on this domain. And he says, oh, we had a client in New Jersey. She had a bakery and she doesn't know what she's going to do with it. it. None of that is true. I couldn't find any of it. Is there, do I have any reciprocity for that? Um, so a couple things. Uh, just because you have a name and a trademark does not automatically entitle you to a domain name. It's frustrating, and a lot of people get very angry about that. Because presumably, what, what is made by Princess? What, what is your brand? What do you do with that Party name? inspiration, recipes, crafts, DIYs. So if somebody wanted to start an energy drink called Made by a Princess, they could do that, because that's not your genre. Right. So you're only protected in your class of goods, presuming that, with registration even. So anybody can use that name so long as they're not infringing. So they can sit on that domain, unfortunately. You can offer to buy it, um, which a lot of people don't want to do because now all of a sudden they realize you want it, and so the price goes right. up. And that's right. a cost-benefit analysis you have to make for your business. Right. Um, but ultimately, my, my suggestion is always, if you can buy it, buy it, even if it makes you angry to pay a little bit of extra money because it's worth it. I just had a, this happen to a client. Um, but watch it. Monitor it. Make sure they don't put anything up there. Um, make sure they're not infringing on your name. And so, yeah, 
I've been watching this for years. Thinking yeah. Maybe that credit card's going to expire and they don't get Does it just new. auto renew? Yeah, for years. Yeah. It's like eight years. You, I, I hear this a lot, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, hi. Thanks hi. so much for today. It's been really helpful. Um, trademark question. Sure. I have a trademark. It's about eight, uh, seven or eight years old. I just renewed it, or I'm in the process of renewing it. Okay. Or doing the, you have to Declaration pay. of use. Y yes, thank you. You're welcome. Um, is it worth it to me to change the um, description of it if, the, if it has evolved? And and it's sometimes it's it's like it's if if it's the you know if it ain't broke don't fix it thing I've been going with that, and um, it does more or less encompass the fact that I'm a blogger. But it you know I almost wanted to just say recipe blog and that's pretty much it. So is it worth the three fifty to re, you know? So that's a loaded question. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's a complicated one. Yeah. Um, if you try to change or add classes, it's essentially a new exactly. registration. Right. Yep. And so they're going to run you through it all again. Yep. Um, that being said, if you're, you want to make sure that your class fully encompasses your business, right? Because you don't want someone to be able to infringe because your class is written differently because of the way that people registered blogs eight years ago is far different than the class now. Yeah. So I would have to look at how it's currently described, what you're doing, and then I could give you an assessment on that. So the universal question would be for anybody considering a trademark, yeah. should they just try to just cram things into that description? And you know what I mean? Because this is for anybody considering it. Sure. That's who I'm thinking about, you know? It, it depends yeah. is the other answer. Yeah, yeah. You cram too much, you're gonna get rejected. And you get rejected quick. Yeah. Um, you have to cram the right amount. <laughs> yeah. Mine, mine's like and four lines long. It's yeah, like <laughs> so it, it really, you, that's why crafting the class is so critical and so hard and takes many years of practice to do it right. Yeah. Um, and so crafting the class is one of the most important things. You, besides your research, crafting your class is one of the most important. You can register in multiple classes. You also have to remember that, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, you have to tell the trademark office between years five and six of every registration you're still using it because mm -hmm. they don't let you sit on trademarks you're not using. So if your class, you're suddenly not using it anymore and that's changed, you may have to. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing to think okay. about. Cool. Right on. Thanks. Hi. Is liability insurance for a blogger recommended or is an entity enough? That's a great question. So it depends on the type of work that you're doing. Do you love my lawyer, it depends answers? <laughs> they, that's all they teach in law school is just say, it depends, and then, no, I'm kidding. We, I learned a little more. It really, honestly, it does depend. So my clients that are networks, my clients that are doing a large volume of sponsored content, or my clients that, because I, that, are getting information from somebody else that they're then liable for because you guys may not realize this, but when you work with networks, those networks are rep doing reps and warranties, which is part of a contract, basically, I promise, are rep and warranting to the brand that they're going to make sure that all of your content is not infringing anything, is not using, um, is not using images you're not supposed to use. And so for them, I say, yeah, you have to. Um, for a blogger that's, you know, doing a lot of images, a lot of video, is taking images from other people, it can't hurt. Because what insurance, the, the LLC just limits your liability to whatever assets your LLC has. But it still can come after all the assets of your LLC. So if you have a lot of assets in your LLC, then you have a potential for high liability. The insurance will cut that. And it's really good for copyright infringement, trademark infringement, defamation, likeness releases, which things people never want to think about. Like you can't just put a picture of somebody up on your website because you took it. That's not permission. So it depends on the type of work that you're doing. Um, and I'd have to look at the website and let you know. But for the, the clients I typically recommend it to are the ones that are either using other people's images or writing controversial topics. That's one of the considerations, but there are many, and I can certainly you know, give that opinion. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I've got two, hopefully, questions that if nobody else jumps in. But uh, the first one is, what do you do if there is a other famous person that has your name? <laughs> um, so, like, I have, I have my name, my middle initial, lastname.com, uh -huh. but I, I can't get uh, the other one because it's some guy over in the U.K. who has no interest in selling it. So, um, like, what do you do in that scenario? Is there, and there's no, like, legal problems I'm going to face, right? from trying to build a brand around my name. Around your name? Right. Uh, it, it, the <laughs> <laughs> it depends. <laughs> 
no. As long as you are using, you, typically, no. As long as you're not trying to capitalize off of their name, like you have a legitimate brand, you're legitimately using your own name, nine times out of 10 that you're fine. So it really, it's the people who are squatting, who are trying to dilute somebody's name. And if you're not trying to do that, if you're in no way, shape, or form trying to pass yourself off as that person, you should not have an issue because people share names like that, that exists. And just because someone's incredibly famous does not necessarily mean that no one else can ever use that name. Um, but the problems come when there's a blurred line. If you try to do something cute, you know, where you try to drive traffic using that name, that's when the issues happen. Got it. Uh, the other question was, can you speak to, because there's a lot of rumors, especially like with YouTube around like what is fair use if you're providing commentary? Uh, so like, can I use 10 seconds of a song or 10 seconds of a clip or, sure. or like the video earlier where we, you know, we use these videos as an example. Ready? Yeah. It depends. Okay. <laughs> so fair use is fact by fact, case by case. It is one of those situations I cannot give you a bright line rule for. It is as frustrating for the content creators and the people who are using it as the lawyers who have to evaluate it. Every, all the courts have like these, ma I mean the case law around fair use is crazy. There are certain rule, there's no hard fast rule, you must only use eight seconds of a song. It really just depends on, your work can't replace that work, right? Like that's the whole point. You're using it to comment on it, a purity, or for scientific research. The less likely the work is to commercially take funds from that copyrighted work or replace that work, the more likely it is fair use. Um, so that's sort of what the balancing is. Honestly, get permission. I know sometimes it can be incredibly expensive. I know sometimes it can be frustrating, but just ask. A lot of times they'll say, yeah, five seconds, that's fine. You'd be surprised. And I know famous songs are a lot more difficult and you don't, I, I, you don't want to get that cease and desist. Cool. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Go. Oh, oh. <laughs> sure. Sorry. Go, Go for, for it. it. I just have a quick question. So we are all working on these different social media platforms and stuff like that. And let's say you have someone that says um, there are some platforms that if they file a request for them to take down the image because it's so similar and they just automatically take it down, but I didn't violate anything. Do I have, and then of course they're like this huge people that you can't seem to get an answer from to get it back up, like to defend yourself, like do I have any recourse in that? I get this question a lot. I'm assuming you're talking about Pinterest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pinterest is tough. That's not so much of a, that's their, the problem is Pinterest knows that if Pinterest leaves up something that's copyrighted and that it's, you've, you've put up there in violation of somebody else's pop, in violation of somebody else's copyright, they get massive fees and fines, and it's a big deal for them. So that's why typically they're very fast to just pull it down, and then you have to go through the process. There's not much you can do for that product. That's not a legal, that's a Pinterest thing. Like, that's their terms and conditions. That's what yeah, you agree to. Yeah, that's what to. I figured. So I was it is. That being said, um, reach out to the person who, pull, who filed it. A lot, of a lot of times people get so nervous, and this is what Julie was saying. Just ask. Like, I can't tell you the number of times that people are like, they're just so angry and this and that. Kill them with kindness. Like, Julie's advice was amazing in terms of negotiation. Like, just ask. The worst thing someone's ever going to do is say no and maybe give you some four-letter words, which you were prepared <laughs> for anyway. And our skin is thick, so we don't care because that person's not cool. So just ask. And so a lot of times I have clients come to me in an uproar, so angry, and I get it. That is emotional, and that's a big deal to you guys. That's your traffic, that's your money, that's your livelihood, and it sucks. <laughs> um, and so I, my recommendation is always, you try first. I say that to everybody. I'm never gonna step in um, and, and write a letter until my client has tried first, because you get far, way farther than I do, because the minute a lawyer steps in, everything changes. People's backs go up against the wall, no matter how cute and fun I am. They don't think that over email or in, on a phone call. So yeah, just ask. And they can, I'm pretty sure, I'm, they can reverse it themselves and, and withdraw the complaint. So a lot of times you're like, this is a misunderstanding, here's my picture, you know, I just want to clear this up. And I know not everyone is that rational. Oh yeah, so I was just trying to see if like, if you had run into this, if there are I do. Like, secret no person to some people know people at pinterest and that works but no there's no standard all right thank you ladies so thank much you.